five students uh, into in-person learning on February the 15th. And that will be followed by our middle school students and high school students on February 22nd, a week later. Uh, we continue to remain in a state of readiness uh, to follow that direction from our board. I want you all to know that our facilities are ready. We have the plans in place. We have adequate staffing in-person instruction um, in the rotation that we previously communicated. And several members of our district leadership team are here in this briefing today to provide updates about some of the topics generating the most conversation and concern in our community. One of those topics is the COVID vaccine and when our student facing staff will have access and opportunity to be vaccinated. So Kathy Elling and uh, Monica Adamian will provide some additional information, but I wanted to state emphatically that getting student facing staff access to the vaccine is a top priority uh, for all in our district. We, uh, along with our Board of Education, are advocating in every possible way to make sure those who interact with students get early and equitable appointments to protect themselves from the virus. Since the beginning of this pandemic, we have worked very closely with our partners uh, at Mecklenburg County Public Health and uh, the partnership uh, with the health department remains very strong. They share our belief that student facing staff are essential to our community and thus deserve early vaccine access. However, I think it's important to say this, uh, however, current state policy defines the order in which groups may receive access and county officials do not have the authority to make changes to that order. Most student facing staff are included in group three of the North Carolina vaccination priority order. And as of now, as of now appointments through the first three weeks in February in Mecklenburg County include groups one and two. And our conversations with the public health officials, including um, some of the largest healthcare providers in our area, Atrium and Novant, those conversations are, are ongoing. And we're very hopeful that more vaccine doses are delivered more quickly and that healthcare partners can accelerate the access. So as we get more clarity on when student facing staff can begin to get vaccinated, we will share our staff plans for how we will facilitate opportunities to help them receive this critical protection. This will include working with school district, with, with uh, schools district wide to make sure that our student facing staff can take the time necessary to attend the vaccination appointments. We want to provide that flexibility. And as I said, we will communicate uh, those details in the coming weeks. Another topic I know that is generating much conversation is the very difficult decision. Uh, that our leadership team made to pause. And I wanna say again, pause athletics for teams not already participating in postseason competition. Uh, we recognize the importance of athletics and other extracurricular activities, but after much consultation with our local public health officials with community spread at an all time high, uh, we made the decision to protect the health and safety of our student athletes, our coaches and our staff. And we've seen a number of cases in our athletic programs over the past several months, but have followed the proper procedures and protocols to mitigate the spread. And so this week, some previously reported cases in two of our school's athletic programs were classified as clusters by our county public health officials. And I want you to know that it's our intent to resume athletic practices and competitions as we return students to in-person learning in February. And so speaking of those COVID cases now classified as clusters, I wanna be very clear. The classification of cases as a cluster 
in a facility does not mean that particular facility has any more COVID cases than previously reported. In all instances, individuals who um, were confirmed, um, they have been outside, I'm sorry, they've been inside of our facilities since the initial positive test was reported. So let me say that again. In all instances, individuals with confirmed cases have not been inside our facilities since the initial positive test was reported. And so it means that after contact tracing, cases were deemed to be related and must be reported to state health officials as a cluster. So the three clusters identified in our schools this week will be on the metrics reporting beginning Monday, and they will remain on that report for 28 days since the last case in each cluster was identified. Another very important subject that we want to address today is student performance. There have been reports of less than desirable subject matter mastery, higher failure rates than in previous years, and our own data analysis shows similar status. So while this pandemic has upended many aspects of life with schools among the most prominent, even when remote learning is deemed necessary by our board, those are unacceptable results. And we have developed and we're implementing mitigation strategies to address both the teaching and learning aspects during remote learning. Our district leadership is working with learning community uh, leadership to drive a school by school effort to improve mastery of critical information. And we will make sure our teaching methods and the content we provide align with our students' needs and we're committed to making those improvements as quickly as possible. We'll continuously update our board members and the public on our progress in this area. And so I want to thank you all for joining us today. A few of our staff members now uh, may have some information to add, and then we will open up our meeting um, for any questions you may have. Thank you, Superintendent Winston. Uh, if there are any of our panelists, uh, Dr. Hayes, Dr. Barnes, uh, Monica or Kathy that have anything you'd like to add, just uh, speak up and uh, we'll be brief though so that we can uh, have, have some, some time for some questions from our friends in the media. I see we have a few uh, hands raised already. Well, with, with that, uh, I will begin, I, I see uh, quite a few hands raised. And like I said, we will uh, notify one member of the media at a time, ask her, uh, allow you to ask a question, uh, open up your, your mic to do so, and then uh, we'll remute and, and move to the, the next members of the media and, and we'll go in order that we see the hands raised. And we're going to start with Brett Jensen from WBT. Hi, Ernest. Thanks for doing this. Uh, I know we really appreciate this. Um, it's been a while. I uh, hope you're well. Uh, real quick, a uh, couple of quick things in terms of data that you talked about your analysis. Uh, can you tell us what the actual failure rate is? Is it a, close to a third, um, especially like in math, that was basically said last week at the school board meeting? And also, can you talk about and give us a number, because I'm sure you probably have the data, the actual loss of students that you guys have had so far where you just can't get in touch with them. I know last year was several thousand before you finally got to them. Can you just give us an update on how those two situations stand? Thanks. Sure, thank you, Mr. Jensen. Uh, my name is Frank Barnes, and I serve in the Office of Equity and Accountability for the school district. Uh, when we look at grades three through 13, uh, three through 13, and we looked at the, the percent of students who have at least one F letter grade uh, that stand at the end of the second quarter at 32.9%. Um, that was in the aggregate. Uh, what we, in looking at our data, um, not all of our, sub, all of our subgroups are seeing increased failure rates, 
but there were four particular subgroups uh, that were particularly um, caught our awareness and that we're looking at specifically. Uh, that's uh, black students, Hispanic students, English learner students, and students with disabilities. Uh, those rates were higher than their peers, although all subgroups saw increases. Regarding the, your question around students who we've lost contact with, uh, we need to go back and make sure that we're giving you accurate data so we can make sure we bring that to the media. Certainly that can be shared at future media briefings or at future opportunities to share data with the public. Thank you, Dr. Barnes. Uh, the next question I see is from Paige Hopkins. Paige. Hey there, thanks for taking my question. Paige here from Charlotte Agenda. Um, I was wondering about the student facing staff and teachers vaccines, wondering what the district's plan is for teachers who don't wanna take the vaccine and is that something that the district or uh, the school board could require? Thank you for that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start us off, uh, Ms. Elling, and uh, certainly invite you to provide any additional remarks. Um, thank you for the question, Paige. So we understand, and I'm sure you are aware, that employers have the authority to mandate um, that their employees uh, receive the vaccine. Uh, we do not have any current plans in our district to mandate um, that our employees receive the vaccine. I know that's a very touchy subject and it's a very personal subject um, to many, uh, not just in our district, but in our community. Uh, and so we wanna be respectful and thoughtful in um, as part of that uh, process. We certainly do plan to share information uh, with our staff members as that information becomes available and vaccination opportunities uh, open up uh, for our staff members. And so we look forward to sharing more information uh, with our staff members. We sh shared information this week uh, and we'll continue to do so. Ms. Elling. Uh... One other thing, we are working with the health department to provide an opportunity for uh, the medical director to um, come and give a town hall presentation to our staff when we get close to having the vaccine ready, answer any questions, possibly talk with people about hesitations and concerns, and uh, hopefully be able to continue to encourage everyone to get vaccinated. Elsa Gillis from WSOC TV. Thank you, Patrick. Um, hi, Superintendent Winston. Thanks for taking my question. Um, quick clarification followed by a question on the um, clusters that were just reported. So it's my understanding that these were previously reported cases um, that were already on the metrics report. Um, they've now been deemed clusters. So is there anything the district can do or is doing to speed up that reporting. I've heard a lot of concern from teachers and parents, you know, just the community about the lag in learning about things like, like this and they're concerned about being back in classrooms because of that. Monica, do you wanna take that one based on recent uh, reports? Sure, some of what um, I would say to that is that we, when we receive information about a case, we start the contact tracing and we quarantine anyone who is a close contact. The designation of a cluster is really done after the fact with input from the health department to determine that these cases were epidemiologically linked within 14 days. So it does not change how we approach our strategies to uh, quarantine and isolate anyone who is positive. One of the clusters we identified this week was um, cluster, a cluster that has not been on our data dashboard because the cases were identified this week as well. So we feel like we are working closely with the health department in this process and absolutely addressing the concerns in the school building as they arise. And I, and I just want to reiterate that, that in, in the case this week, uh, 
of, of one of those clusters that we just uh, notified the public of yesterday. This was within a week when uh, the cases were reported and then the county contact tracing identified and classified that as a cluster. So uh, we are seeing some, some speeding up of some of that reporting. So I think that will address some of those concerns. Paige Peruso from WBT. V. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. I hope you guys can hear me okay. Um, Superintendent Winston, uh, the board is still planning to reconvene on February 9th, I believe, to take a vote to return to in-person learning. I guess, why are you so sure that you'll be able to return? And, and second, many parents have been frustrated with the inconsistency of education for their students. What would you say to those, uh, those parents and families who are dealing with you know, virtual then in-person and the back and forth that's only you know, a couple of weeks apart between these decisions? Thank you for that question, Paige. Here's what I would say. I'm one of those parents. I'm frustrated as well. I and my entire team in the district, our senior leaders, our principals, our educators, our support staff, we want kids back in our classrooms. But we only want to do that when it's safe to do so. So I feel the frustration that parents have. And I want to let them know that we're taking every precaution. We have protocols and processes in place to make sure that we're keeping our students and staff members safe when they walk in our buildings. And so it is our intent at the February 9th board meeting after we have looked at the data from the previous week to share with our board a recommendation based on the data that we have at hand. Next, we have Christina Bowling. Hey there, thanks, Patrick. Um, hello, Mr. Superintendent. Uh, it's Christina Bowling from the Charlotte Ledger. Um, I wanted to, this, this may be something you touched on at the top. I was late logging in, but I'm wondering, do you foresee um, any problems with staffing PPE busing, you know, that could potentially delay things, um, shortages and things like that? Um, I have also talked to some teachers who said they're worried about the sub pool and having enough substitutes once school is back in. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about that, particularly substitutes. I just had to uh, get myself off mute, Miss Bowling. It is uh, good to hear your voice. Um, so, you know, it's very difficult. You know, I wish I had a crystal ball uh, to be able to say what will happen in two, three, four, five weeks. But here's what I know, that as of today, we are ready. Our staff readiness metrics show that we are ready. We're taking steps to ensure that we have a strong substitute teacher pool. We've extended the time frame in which individuals can apply to be substitute teachers. We've reached out to areas that we previously uh, perhaps didn't reach out to, uh, including retirees and others who volunteer in the district. Those are strategies that uh, we're employing to uh, beef up our substitute pool. So we're taking the steps necessary uh, to ensure that we can bring our students and staff members uh, back into our classrooms as quickly as possible. Uh, but I don't have a crystal ball and cannot say with complete certainty um, that, um, you know, this or that will actually happen. So um, I just wanted to be very clear and transparent um, with you with regard to that. Mr. Superintendent, if I could add regarding our analysis and monitoring of all of our staffing metrics, um, we certainly are taking a day-to-day -day look at that um, and we're analyzing um, the potential for extended leaves for some folks uh, that is, Leave, um, leaves that are optional for them and they have the right to take those. So we will be looking at that very closely week to week. Our instructional staffing, our teaching side, 
Uh, the house is looking particularly solid at this time and we're very grateful because as you know, learning is continuing now. Um, students are in learning. They're receiving instruction every day and we're very grateful for our instructional staff who are providing that learning um, remotely at this time. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, next two questions, we have Kari Beal first and then Annie Ma. Oops, I think somehow Kari dropped off. Annie, uh, we'll uh, go ahead and unmute your mic. If Kari Hello. Found... Um, hi, Superintendent. Um, I had a question um, about vaccines. I, I know back in the fall, prior to the start of in-person learning, there was a pretty coordinated effort to give COVID tests to teachers returning to the building. Um, one thing that I would love to know is what can teachers and student facing staff expect in terms of the logistics of how they'll get the vaccine? Should they contact their provider? Should they go through the county health department? Will there be a CMS drive? I'd love to know. Um, I know it's in the planning stages, but whatever light you can shed on that, I think would be greatly appreciated. Thanks, Danny. Um, this is Kathy Elling. I'll start and then I know um, Monica's going to jump in with some um, more up to date information. You are absolutely correct. We want to make the vaccine as accessible to our staff as possible and as quickly as possible. And what we're encouraging staff to do right now is two things. One, the source for the most current information regarding vaccine availability is our health department. So any updates we want that we, instead of driving to our website, we want everyone to go to their website. And as our plans are formulated, we're gonna let you know very specifically uh, what those plans are. Secondly, we are encouraging all staff to go ahead and pre-screen for vaccine. Um, you can do that with your private physician. If you're affiliated with the atrium, if your physician's affiliated with atrium or Novant, you have access to pre-screening and then when your turn is up, like when you're next, and that's important. So those are the two things we're asking people to do right now. And uh, Monica, what else would, is there to, would you add to that? As the groups, um, as the groups are opened up through the health department system, they do have opportunities to sign up for appointments. So right now they are still only groups one and two, and um, that would include anyone who's over 65 but um, just to pay attention to those things because they do change quickly. Um, at this time, there's still concerns around the supply and how quickly the supply comes to the health department, but they get updates weekly and they continue to update us. And as they hope, are hopeful and optimistic that they'll get more vaccine and increased supplies, we'll continue to work on plans and share those with our staff. Thank you. And I see Kari, you've uh, rejoined us and you were next. So I'm going to go ahead and, and jump to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I pressed the wrong button. So that's why I jumped out for a second. And uh, this is Carrie Beal with Spectrum News. I'm just checking that you can hear me now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so my question, it's in reference to the petition that's been going around for the swimmers in CMS. I know you've seen that, Mr. Winston, and I think you've responded to a lot of the parents about it. And so my question is, I know you said that some sports were able to continue because they weren't in their postseason yet, and other sports um, uh, weren't already in their postseason. So that's why I understand volleyball and cross country were able to continue. Um, so my question is, and some of the parents have expressed this, why not just say all sports will end right now or when you made that decision last week or, you know, um, what went into deciding what sports would continue and what wouldn't? Thank you, Ms. Bill. I appreciate that question. Let me say that um, I share the disappointment that many of our student athletes and their families have about our decision to pause our high school athletic activity. I know the important role that sports play um, for many of our students. As I've said before, when I announced the decision, I'm a former student athlete. Although I know I was nowhere near as good as 
Dr. Barnes or Dr. Hayes or Ms. Elling, but I understand the important role that sports play. And it teaches us life lessons. It teaches us leadership. It teaches us teamwork. It teaches us character and fairness. But it's also important to understand that the pandemic has changed our lives and we must, we must do all that we can to put safety on the field, on the court, in the pool. We have to put that first. And so, you know, what I would reiterate is that this pause is exactly that. It's a pause. And we welcome the opportunity to bring our student athletes back when we begin returning students uh, to in-person learning. Thank you. And, and we're right up against our time right now, but we have two members of the media that have had their hands raised for quite a while, haven't had one question yet. So if our panelists are okay, uh, we will have a question from Ashley Daly and then one from Paige Felling. Ashley. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Ashley Daly with WCNC. Um, I know uh, Mr. Jensen kind of touched on this, asked about this earlier in uh, today's meeting, but I was just curious. So the NCDPI put together a report for the General Assembly, which said 15,000 students across the state of North Carolina are currently unaccounted for. Um, and I was wondering how many of those students are within CMS? So how many students right now are unaccounted for within the district? I think Dr. Barnes, I think you shared some information about that. If you don't mind taking that, please. Surely. Those are some things we're going to have to look at. We have been looking at both um, student attendance and absenteeism rates, but I need to go back to our team to confirm uh, the number of students who we've lost contact with, uh, just so I can make sure we provide something that's accurate to our public. And our, our final question will be from Paige Felling. Uh, for those of you uh, who, who have additional questions, please submit them to our media relations team and we'll do our best to, uh, to address the, the topics that are important to you and your audiences. Thank you. Uh, Paige. Patrick, impressive pronunciation for my last name there. By the way, I can't believe I'm our third page on this call. I'm Paige with no I, so hi to all. Thank you so much for talking with us and giving us info today. Um, I'm new to, to these because I'm usually on mornings. I'm just on a new day part. So it's it's great to, to hear from you guys live and not just listening to a soundbite the next day. Um, my question is is sort of two part and I'll, and I'll be quick because I know that you're probably eager to uh, get on with things here. But in Fairfax County, Virginia, uh, you're probably more familiar than this with this than I. Uh, I am possibly right now, but the, the teachers there requested to be put basically into an earlier group from my understanding to get the vaccinations. Is that on the radar at all for us here to get our teachers into groups one or two to kind of move them up in the line? And if so, have we done any sort of questioning surveys with them as far as if they did that, what kind of numbers would we be looking at in terms of which teachers would want it in the first place and who maybe wouldn't it uh, anyway? Thanks guys. Let me start. Um, we we are in conversations with the health department, and I think you may have heard uh, Monica explain that our health department is following the state's uh, guidance and protocols around who, who gets the vaccine when. Um, what I'm sure people are aware of too is a delicate balance between the amount of vaccine that we are currently getting into the community and how quickly we can administer it. They're getting about. If I'm right, Monica, we, we understand about a week's notice um, for the incoming batch of vaccine. And so they're working as quickly as they can through the protocol that the state had established. Um, that said, we're talking with our partners to be ready to uh, provide as quick access to the vaccine for teachers that we can possibly or and our forward facing staff as quickly as we can. Thank you, Kathy. 
And thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today. We have run just a bit over our time. Apologize uh, sincerely for the, uh, the delay in starting. We, we know what the glitch was and we should not ever face that again. So that's the good news. And uh, Ms. Felling, uh, I, I guess it was a 50-50 shot. I'm glad we got it right. Uh, but everybody, I hope, uh, thank you for joining us. If you do have further questions, please let us know. We'll do our best to answer them in a timely manner. Uh, and hope everybody has a really, really good weekend. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.